So hello everyone and welcome to another conversation of the cycle of conversations on corporeal architecture. And today I am very happy and honored to have here as guest Alberto Perez Gomez. Alberto Perez Gomez studied architecture and practiced in Mexico City. In 1983, he became director of the Carleton University School of Architecture in Ottawa, Canada. Since 1987, he occupied the Bronfman Chair at McGill University, where he founded the History and Theory postgraduate programs. His books include Architecture and the Crisis of Modern Science uh, from 1983 and won the Hitchcock Award in 1984. Polyphilo from 1992, Architectural Representation and the Perspective Hinge from 1997, Built Upon Love, Architectural Longing After Ethics and Aesthetics from 2006, Attunement and Timely Meditations from 2016. Alberto, thank you very much for accepting this invitation and uh, being here again for a second round of conversation with my students. I'm delighted to be here with you. It's always fun. They have very good questions. Well, that's my experience from the past. <laughs> okay, so now, now I feel a little nervous because I have to start and uh, I, I will have to top, top the level or at least match the level from last time. So, but this is all part of the excitement of these wonderful, wonderful conversations. Alberto, like I mentioned before, we, we were watching the lecture that you sent us before as, as preparation and we talked a little bit about it afterwards. Um, so I would like to, to start with, uh, I, I made a few notes from, from the lecture that we can anchor, maybe anchor our conversation. Uh, so this time I, I would like to start with this, uh, with this uh, statement you made that our bodies are naturally distempered and we need uh, architecture to give us uh, this sense of balance and sense of, uh, of attunement. So since it's the first time that this group of students is acquainted with your work, I would like to ask you, how, how did you start, got to this idea of, of, of thinking about how can architecture be consciously used as something that can bring us into balance? Yes, I think that statement, uh, Maria, it comes from uh from trying to understand the problem in, a, in really more from the point of view of philosophy than from the point of view of neuroscience or medicine. Um, it is actually Martin Heidegger that speaks very eloquently about this, you know, and that's where I would uh, send all of you if you're interested in this. He, he basically uh, argues that, uh, that the human condition, uh, given our self-conscious awareness of our mortality is by definition out of tune. Right? There, is, there is something about the, the, this, that, that is inherent in the human condition that is out of tune and that our, our basically our human condition calls that we seek constantly this attunement while becoming aware, while being aware of the fact that this condition will always prevail. Uh, because for Heidegger, the, the forgetfulness of mortality is one of the worst problems uh, philosophically, you know, for, for, for the contemporary uh, individual. Uh, this forgetfulness is of course uh, typically uh, uh, celebrated basically by a technological culture that wants to completely ignore this uh, this uh, human condition as something which is fundamental to understand what uh, what we are called to do about it, you know, and, and of course it, this in, involves, is a philosophical statement, so it involves everything in life, but when it comes to architecture it's quite interesting because, because it, uh, it takes the problem in another dimension that cannot really be solved through some kind of idea about optimization or you know, making things simply be more comfortable. Uh, the, the, the issue being that somehow uh, the, the you know, architecture has to address this condition that, that is inherent in humanity and which implies limits. And so the, the, you see, the, 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 what is interesting about this for me is that of course architects always understood that part of what they did is to make visible limits 
physical limits. You know, we build walls, we build, yes. But the issue is more than, than just the physical wall. And of course, you know, in, in ancient Greece and ancient Rome, it was very clearly understood that the limits had, were of course connected to walls, but were more than the walls. You know, the, the, the Hora, for example, of a, of a, of a, of a city was, was a region that to, for all intents and purposes, for us, is quite invisible. Like for us, the city of Athens finishes with the walls, but for the Greeks, uh, uh, it was, you know, it was something else. It was determined, it's kind of an invisible boundary of, uh, of, of, um, of influences that have to do with the temples, of course, of the, of the divinities that are built outside of the walls and that made the territory auspicious for human life. And, and this is the reason why in many of these cultures, uh, the, even though the city walls were pretty much permanent from a contemporary perspective, they were built, the, the rituals of foundation had to be reenacted periodically because otherwise things might fall out of tune. So the ritual, the, 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 the condition, this of course begs the question of the very nature of architecture because it's, it's both this visible condition but it is also the rituals that uh, architecture frames and that makes the possibility of attunement possible. So that's where this, this is coming from, you know, is that we talk a lot about making things more responsive to, to human sensibilities and, 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 and you know, so that, that, that we make things less upsetting, I guess one could say, but, but it's more, it's really more about this kind of philosophical attunement uh, ultimately. And so, uh, I think that if we forget that condition, uh, we, we don't fully grasp what architecture is about. That's basically what I, I'm trying to say with that, I think. I don't remember exactly the context of my words, you know, but, but I think that's where that is coming from. This idea of distemper, of, of distemper. It's, it's, it's fascinating because I think one of the first, it's, it's almost like one could, one could, um, uh, name the historical origin of this problem sometime around 11,500 BC when, when uh, hunter-gatherers that were pretty much at ease in, in, in nature suddenly felt the need, which is hard to understand otherwise, to build this huge temple in what is now Gobelki Tepe in Turkey. And nobody really knows why suddenly humans that were, really didn't have cities were not settled. It's before agriculture is before the beginning of cities, it went to the trouble of, which would have been an organizational nightmare because these people were not used to this kind of, of operation to build this cosmic structure, you know, in the middle of what is now, well, it's nowhere in, in Turkey. And this is like 5,000 years before Stonehenge. And it's a relatively recent archeological discovery you know, nobody thought, nobody thought that humans were interested in these things before. Everybody thought that actually we came together for practical reasons. We discovered architect, ag agriculture, then we built cities, then we became settled, then we made little villages, then it grew, they became big cities and everything was kind of understood materially. But now I think the challenge is that this thing that just happened out of the blue and it really is the result of some kind of deep spiritual need Obviously, there's no other, or no other explanation that I think we have inherited. Now, I could grant that human, uh, hu the human psyche, you know, and human evolution may end, up, may end up taking us somewhere else where we don't need that, where we don't need this kind of, 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 of uh, uh, acknowledgement about our existence. But I think that right now, the way I see it at least, and of course I'm 71 years old, so maybe I'm getting old and maybe people don't agree with me, but we still have this need to understand, to understand our place in the world through uh, our understanding of mortality, right? And I think this is where, this is, this is super important. Uh, I think it's more important than a lot of the smaller things that, that, we, that we are often concerned with when we're talking about architecture. Uh, and, you know, we can do many things, but I think good architecture fundamentally does that, at least in my opinion. Uh, that's, 
ultimately what matters. Yes, uh, Alberto, I, I, I took a little bit to, to tune in because I was uh, pro processing, I was listening and processing also because while we were talking, I had this immediate association in my mind uh, of one of my favorite scenes from, from uh, the film of Stanley Kubrick of the Space Odyssey, when these uh, proto-humans uh, uh, in start interacting with a monolith that arrives there. That's right. and changes that happen in, because something uh, this this uh, artifact or this uh, thing came there and then started to create all these ripples and all these uh, changes in consciousness and in awareness and and i always have to think that this this is such a that sketch really has such a profound meaning for architects because we can really understand uh, in in this very uh, iconic way uh, the influence and, and the impact that, that what we build has in the environment. And also exactly like you were saying, that there is something within, within us, within the humans that already uh, drives us to, to aspire to, to create something like that. So in that case, the monolith comes from, from somewhere. Uh, and there's a lot of speculation also that, that some of these uh, early uh, findings could have had some uh, external influences but we, we don't we don't know we don't know and it's it's also in this not knowing that uh that that is very interesting to 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 theorize and also kind of to speculate and and i was also now reminded of of kind of a personal experience i had a few months ago i could go to portugal and visit for the third time my young uh, nephew and we were in we couldn't we could only be outside so i did a small game with him that i i hoped he would remember so we were in a forest and i picked up a few pebbles and did a circle and the game was that he would have to pick up more pebbles and fill in the circle from the outside within and and then i was so happy a few uh, weeks ago because my sister told me you know when we go there he keeps doing this game he loves to do it and the circles get bigger and so on so the, i think that uh, this is something that we can really tune into already as children this idea of picking up the material we find in the environment and creates a sense of place and a sense of structure and everything that can be that can be built around this and also a sense of connect, connectedness, uh, and and in this case for me it was it was also a very moving experience because I rarely see my nephew. He's in Portugal and I'm in Germany, uh, and so it was a kind of connecting exercise. So I find it very nice that every now and then he he does it he does it again, and I think that we need to to think about these rituals uh, and really to consciously think how when we are doing architecture and design we are creating these patterns and creating these um, connections, these uh, relationships. Yeah, uh, I, I like very much your, your, your association to the Kubrick uh, scene because I think that's right on, <laughs> Maria. I think this is very interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. Um, and and I'm, I feel so lucky that I have the opportunity to, to share these associations uh, with you. It's, it's really uh, almost uh, impossible to accept that it's happening. Uh, so I, I was also, I'm now going here through, through my quotes. I don't know if anyone uh, in the audience would like to make a comment until I move to the next one. Maybe we can make this a little bit more flexible instead of just waiting for the end. Because I saw that Milton was also very synchronized and taking some notes. I don't know if he would like to, to also if, maybe if comment. Please interrupt and interject. I, I am delighted. I... Always a pleasure, Alberto. Thank you, Milton. You're very kind. So, so I do have a question that goes back to uh, primal spatial orientation and ritual. Yeah. And I'm curious about what might be instinctual to see what are the most uh, profound drivers of architectural experience that we might also see in modern uh, human experience. Yes. I don't is know what the answer is, but I think it's a it's a it's it, very it interesting question. Fascinating yeah. to find out. You're probably aware of uh, of Cassiri, right? Of uh, and the, the 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 philosophical the and anthropology the philosophical anthropology of Ernst Cassiri, where he talks about about uh, these questions of uh, of orientation up, down, right, left, front, and back, as like you say, it's something which is primeval. I think 
that uh, a lot of the later phenomenologists tried to pick up on that. Um, in, in, ar in architecture, um, I don't, you probably know, of course, um, uh, uh, Norbert Schulz, you know, when he turns to phenomenology, he also speaks a lot about this, the, the importance of, of uh, for example, a kind of um, articulation between place and path as things that might be uh, really quite universal beyond cultural uh, differentiation that, that, uh, that might be important. The, the problem always is of course how to, uh, how to take that, uh, those intuitions and turn them into something productive in the contemporary, in, 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 in contemporary practices. But I think that, uh, that, uh, that, you know, really probably ultimately it has to do with the fact that, uh, that uh, as I guess phenomenology understood through Merleau-Ponty, uh, the, 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 um, the motricity of embodied experience is always oriented. And, you know, it's that, that somehow this, uh, this, generates a kind of spatiality that is prior to any kind of spatial concept. And that really has to do with, with, with in, the, in our case of humans, our bodily morphology, the fact that we are bipedal, that we have, uh, you know, the eyes in the front of our heads, not on, our, not on the sides like fish, <laughs> that, you know, all this, all this really matters immensely. And sometimes we forget, right? Because we are so uh, enamored with, the, with, with how the, the the conceptual space that now appears in the computer can actually be turned upside down. Like, you know, I, re I remember hearing some colleague that will remain on name saying that, well, we, now we don't even need to worry about gravity. You know, architecture is like, you, it's an outer space. And it's not, you know, I mean, we live in this world. You might imagine what it means to go in, uh, in, in a space trip, but, but gravity is fundamental. And, and that's the whole, that's so, yeah, I, I all this is a, of course a bigger discussion but phenomenology has always been very mindful of these uh, fundamental structures that sometimes are forgotten by because of you know stylistic uh, obsessions or like someone someone wants to to, to make uh, walls uh, leaning because it's uh, it's uh, it will bring 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 to the place some tourists or something, right? Uh, but uh, but in fact, uh, there's something that has to be understood about our experience. So yes, I think that's basic. Um, it's very clear, I think, if you look uh, uh, across uh, world cultures to how uh, early human uh, cultures built. There is always this question of orientation that is fundamental, and, and I think we have to take that seriously. Even if we want to to uh, to take our habits in a slightly different direction, I think th this is this is fundamental. So, I think actually there the, um, the 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 places that we inhabited even before we built, like caves, for example, or choosing to be up at a certain elevation to look down rather than below looking up, things like that's that. Right. Um, right. I think get replicated in architecture, yeah. um, and and maybe I'm, I'm I'm sure preceded it. Yes, yes. I will I will pursue that <laughs> and report. <laughs> Very good. Yes, I, I think in, in many ways, and maybe this is also becoming a, a kind of a, of a cliche. We have been so used of, of living in our extremely industrialized uh, societies that, that we really disconnected from, from these aspects of, of interacting with, with the natural environment in, in a really more intuitive way and, and also in, in understanding what would be the, the qualities of, of these environments that would make us relate to it in particular ways, because we also know that this uh, changes a lot uh, depending on the culture and depending on the char characteristics of the territory itself. Um, but, but we have transformed also the ter ter territory we live in so much over so many centuries that what is natural and artificial now, it's also very, very hard to tell. Uh, right. So there's also a lot of a lot of speculation we can do there, and here I would like to pick up another thread from from your talk that I also found especially interesting, when you make a reference to this building from Palladio in Vincenza, 
And uh, you mentioned that uh, it the, what interested you in particular in that pro uh, project was that uh, Palladio very carefully understood the patterns and the habits of the people uh, who were living there so that he could create something new, a new structure that would propose, of course, political and kind of social transformation while respecting what, what was already there. So not, not really a very harsh top-down approach, but more an understanding approach, but still with a progressive uh, perspective. So yeah. I, I found this very interesting. Yes, I find that fantastic as well. And I'll tell you why. There is, of course, a, there, there is a subtext to this that it's not I, I don't mention it in the lecture. Palladio has always has has traditionally, particularly in North America, been considered like uh, the first one of the first modern architects. You know, because he has these uh, perfect uh, 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 concepts of an architecture that is geometrical and that people think he always endeavored to realize. And so, for example, you know, in in North American culture, uh, a very well known critic, you may know his name, Colin Rowe, who was very influential in the Northeast like with a lot of the big American architects, he, he actually made this uh, um, very simplistic um, association between Palladio and Le Corbusier, right? Because of this interest in, in proportions and, and ideal uh, geometries and how that becomes the architecture. But in the, in, it's very fascinating because in the case of Palladio, he was indeed, if you look at his book, uh, the four books on architecture is called, uh, he was indeed very fascinated in, in perfection, the, the perfection of the idea in the platonic sense that is represented in his projects, in his own projects as they appear in the book that are perfect, perfectly dimensioned and proportioned. But what is very interesting is in his practice, the buildings that he builds are anything but these realizations of the of the perfect ideal. They are always incredibly careful with what precedes it, with what is there, with what is found. What Milton was actually alluding to, you know, the fact that there is something that is there habitual. And so the example in Vicenza, for me, for me it really hit a, a chord because I remember honestly that when I was doing my, my master's in England and I went for the first time to Italy to visit, I went to, Pal to Vicenza and I thought when I first went there that Palladio had actually built what he had drawn in his book, which is what I show in the, in the, in the lecture. But in fact, if actually not immediately, a few years later, when I looked very carefully, I was amazed that the footprint of the, of the building in Vicenza is anything but the, the building that he drew in his book, but it's really about exactly what you mentioned, that he was very, um, you know, he really wanted to acknowledge that the, the center of the medieval city had a life that was reflected in this footprint and he did not touch it. He basically built around it to make the world, to elevate that life without really changing the habits, which is a completely different way of how the modern architect would think. Right, the more like they would prefer the tabula rasa, you know, landing the thing and making their genius idea appear. Whereas here, there is this, of course, you know, concern with the ideal. He was very interested in this because it's this kind of platonic dimension of Renaissance culture, but at the same time, being incredibly uh, careful with the habitual, with what uh, what was there in from for, for a long time in the in the medieval city. He did not raise it, so that's why I guess you know that example is close to my heart because it really, it really, uh, it's really my personal experience. I thought that it was that he had actually done the building he drew. It's really amazingly, um, incredibly uh, well crafted, very carefully thought out how the, the this. Uh, idea becomes manifested without actually changing the fabric uh, of, 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 uh, of, the, of the city. So it's a very interesting story. But yes, for me, this is important because, because I think modern architects have the tendency, it's part of, the, of modern technology as well, of modern technological culture, I would say, that, that to believe that uh, 
that uh, there is no problem in, in simply going top down, right? That, that that's really the way to go. And that basically uh, the complexity of culture um, in a way can be reduced or can be assimilated by the genius of the architect, which is never the case. You know, that I think that, that, that always the culture is far richer than what the architect can imagine. And so to, to act more humbly, to, to really understand that the habits have a, 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 are actually a kind of wisdom that you have to be very respectful of uh, is, is, is a better strategy. You know, it's a hermeneutic strategy as well. You know, it's really trying to understand the past and what is there, what you are engaging with in order to, to, to really build up a, a dialogue with your own ideas as an architect. Um, it's something that in fact, uh, uh, Maria, is more, is perhaps less, um, what I'm saying is perhaps more common in, in some European contexts, particularly in Italy. You know, I know that people are like most, most uh, Italian uh, students of architecture that do a Tesi de Laura, the, the final project in a way is dealing with some historical fabric because that's the reality, right? There is so much built up. But, but this goes counter, you know, but the technological ideal is the opposite, right? It's like you, you really go up top down and you try to reduce everything to some kind of condition where you can account for the richness of the lived experience uh, in some, you know, uh, intelligent way, of course, uh, but, but that uh, very often falls short because there, there, there is something up in the habits that is, uh, that is, uh, yeah, it's a kind of wisdom, right? It's a kind of wisdom that is, uh, that is enacted through the gestures that become uh, uh, the habits in cultures and become then uh, traces in cities that uh, one has to take seriously. So I think that's the, that's the story of, uh, of Palladio. But it's usually, it's not only the Basilica, you know, if you look at other buildings, it's very fascinating because a lot of, like I knew a, a colleague, um, Martin Kubelik, uh, historian uh, in, uh, in, in, in the Technical University in Austria. He spent his life looking at the bricks in Villa Rotonda, trying to understand why Palladio did not build what he drew. And I don't think there is much mystery there, you know? It's, it's really, it, he's not, he was not obsessed the way that we are obsessed with this business of top-down. Uh, yes, and, and maybe maybe there was also uh, at the time perhaps more flexibility in yeah. terms of uh, because now we uh, we are so obsessed about the this idea of precision and of designing something which has to be perfectly and precisely executed because of course we have to take in consideration the time and the efficiency and the costs and we are already designing with these with these uh, sort of uh, additional uh, constraints that, that also don't, don't give any tolerance for failure because any kind of failure uh, is, is already an imminent catastrophe. Uh, yes. so, so we are also designing with a lot of fear, I think, uh, and, many, you know, many, you're, many, many, many times, right. highly restricted and with a lot of fear. Um, yes. so, you're absolutely uh, right. You know, I, I, think, I think this is also, let me just say one more thing, because I think this is something fundamental that changed in the beginning of the 19th century, which, go, which, which makes this shift, this change that, we, that you are talking about. Prior to the 19th century, architects honestly believed that the process of translation between their ideas and the building was enriching the result rather than being detrimental to the result. You know, you can read, for example, in, in, in Filarete, it's very clear, he understands that, 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 the, that the building will gain precisely because it's not identical to what you imagined. Mm -hmm. It's because the craft, just the, just the fact that it goes through the hands of the craftsman is an enrichment. We cannot deal with that. Yes, you are right for, con for contractual reasons because we are into the mentality of technology. We cannot accept that. I have another wonderful uh, anecdote about this. It's more than an anecdote. It's the story of this building that I adore, which is La, La Tourette by Le Corbusier, which is the one building by Le Corbusier where he, I think, 
already getting old and understanding this, he actually uh, accepted the mistakes of the construction and actually told his uh, resident architect, which happened to be Senakis, you know, the famous musician, he was not as good an architect as a musician, but he told him not to touch the mistakes, you know, leave it, it's very good. He really learned that, you know, it took him a whole lifetime because in the beginning he was as technological as anybody. But we cannot, we cannot deal with that. I guess, you know, he could do it because he was already a respected architect and, you know, the, he was not questioned. Whereas today, even, you know, you have, you are right. You, you know, you sign, it's like the, the document, the, 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 the building documents are, where have your seal, it's your patent, and this has to be built. This is, this is a, a, a very recent problem. We have straight jacketed ourselves. Yeah. This comes from the 19th century, you know, and it's terrible because it really robs the environment from the richness of this possibility of development through the processes of building. So it's fascinating because, you know, the, the fact that we can talk about it, I think for me, it's hopeful because I think you can, if you, if an architect can understand that, things can become better. But usually if you hear, if you know, what I'm saying is like absurd, you know, because it has nothing to do it with the technological way that we, the way we understand the technology of building, fabrication, uh -huh. right? Yeah. Uh, Alberto, but honestly, I think the straight jacket, or I, I like the, the word expression straight jacket, but sometimes I use the word suffocating rubber suit, the, the, the black <laughs> suffocating rubber suit with the turtleneck. I have it, but that's because I'm cold. <laughs> but we, we kind of get used to it in architecture school because this has really shaped also how we are teaching and how we learn. We all arrive in architecture school thinking that we will learn architecture as the mother of all arts. And we all end up uh, getting out as fearful, disappointed proto-architects who get even more strict through our office practice because we have to learn how to avoid doing mistakes. And we, we are constantly teaching the students not so, so focused on the, of, on the poten creative potential on, on the idea and on this deeper understanding, but how to avoid doing these mistakes as much as possible. The, this became the, the main focus. And I think it's, it's really a problem. I Milton, I think you wanted to say something, yes. I, I just wanted to say that the first school I designed, which was about well, almost 30 years ago, we had five months from the meeting the client and the site on the first day until occupancy, including building permits and bidding and all that stuff. And I was on site with a great big fat pencil drawing from a skeleton set of drawings, absolutely minimal drawings. I had more fun that summer with that project as an architect than I had had prior to that. It was wonderful. It was terrific fun. So let's get, let, let's get back to that somehow. I have no idea how. So if it's possible, yes, I think people are very afraid because of this, you know, lawsuits, it's contractual, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's really a problem. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we need to, we architects, because we also get used to learning how to sell our ideas, we have to learn how to how to sell to the client the idea that the mistakes are actually important an important part of the process, so they can they can grasp the benefits that, it, that can exist. In you know, and and and, and we pay lip service to uh, to collaborative work and all that, but we really don't let go, right? I mean, it's really the 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 the, the, the building is many hands, and these hands are wise. You know, Richard Sennett talks about that. You know, and the importance of craft. Uh, I, I, I am convinced about that. I think that, that, that uh, the most beautiful cities in the world have very little to do or a lot less to do with the genius of architects and much more with the love of the craftsmen, you know, all the, all the, all the love that has been put into, into bringing these things to appearance. And I think we forget that, you know, that that's really what it really touches you. That's really emotional. Uh, and, and we don't, it's not about form or not only about form. It's really, it's really about materiality. And this is many, many hands have to be involved. So, so we really do ourselves a disservice when we think that, that what matters is that we have this genius idea on paper. You know, this also, I, I, I love this book um, that I, I learned a lot from this musicologist, uh, 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 Lydia Gurr, who writes about how for her, uh, he's, she's talking about the history of music, but it's really analogous to the history of architecture, how music uh, enters into a kind of crisis 
at the time of Beethoven, which is really the beginning of the 19th century, when there is this uh, conceit that the work of music is the, the score, is the piece of paper, rather than the performance. He says, musicians prior to Beethoven, of course they wrote, they wrote scores, but they all understood that it is actually the performance that is the music, not the score. So that, that uh, you know, there is a wonderful uh, anecdote of, of um, uh, Wife's Bach using uh, some of the score paper to wrap fish, you know, and someone found this, you know, and they were, they, of course, the musicologists were horrified. How is it possible, right? And I'm sure that Mr. Bach did not care one bit, you know, Mr. Bach wanted to go to the place where the, music will be performed for a particular function, by the way, because it's not aestheticized, like we understand concert music in the 19th century, right? And perform the music because that's, the, that's what the music was. The ontological, you know, the ontology of the music is the performance. Like the ontology of the, of the architecture is the building as experienced. It's not the stupid design on a piece of paper mm -hmm. where we put our, our stamp. So that is so mind boggling when you think about it. It's very, it's incredibly, she puts it in an incredibly clear way when it comes to music. Uh, and for me, it's exactly what happened with architecture, you know, and, and uh, anyhow, it fits, it, it, it happened to work because it fits the, men, the, the mentality, the mentality, the, men, the mentality of developing industrialization and technology. But I think it's, it's really tragic because it, it, uh, it's not good for the, for the, places where we live in the end. Alberto, this also makes makes me think about something also still in, in connection to uh, Palladio's, Palladio's building. Uh, and I had to think about also some memories of, of uh, wonderful historical buildings that, that we have in Lisboa, where I lived and studied for 12 years in, in Portugal. And I was always fascinated how many of these old buildings like monasteries and even uh, buildings which were done as military uh, facilities, how flexible these uh, buildings have been over time, that they had so many uses. They had been uh, uh, monasteries and, the, and hotels and hospitals and schools. Uh, so most of the times, uh, okay, very connected to institutions and to a kind of hierarchical way of, of organizing an institution, but still, there are, there are really many qualities that have to be appreciated in buildings like that. And many of the buildings that we have built after uh, modern movement, uh, more or less architecture or more, more or less just construction, um, they don't have this character. They are, they are highly scripted. Uh, so each room has a specific function, which was uh, ma meant to do this uh, kind of actions and so on and so on. And they don't, don't have this flexibility. So something was also lost in this, yes. in this process. Yes, it's, it's, it's very fascinating. It's, it's very difficult to generalize because I really believe that, that, that architecture and, and ritual or situations really go hand in hand in, in the original intentionality of the architect. Uh, in whichever period, you know, and I think that's what makes it, that's what makes the architecture uh, what it is, because it's really about, about the situation rather than, than, than merely the, the fabric. But I think uh, the, the, the fact that, the, that there is this kind of space between, between uh, conception and execution that we were talking about before, and uh, the, the, the embracing of the craft uh, is perhaps what makes these buildings more generous, you know. I think that's the way that I would that I would put it. Is because they speak about issues that are beyond, that are really beyond and more important than the particularities of the of the of the situations that they were designed for. Really, have to do maybe with this business of limits, with this business of attunement, you know, which which is very fascinating, right? Because then it's not really about about the specificity of of the uh, how to make something adequate. To a certain emotional situation, but it's it's much bigger than that. It's really a philosophical question uh, about what makes humans uh, feel at home. Uh, and uh, I think these buildings, I think this question of, of 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 how they come to be is very important. You know, we we don't we we completely disregard that. We we reduce the coming to be of the building to a kind of neutral technological process that has no meaning. And that's problematic 
fundamentally problematic when it comes to the emotional quality of the spaces in which we live. Yes, yes, Alberto. I was now thinking um, in connection to the topic to the topic of sustainability, and of course, the word sustainability has already been used for a lot of <laughs> different purposes. But but I mean, I, I I try to mean it in a serious in a serious way because we know that the building industry is going to radically change because we know that the, the building industry alone is responsible for, for most of the carbon footprint. So we will build much less in the future, very differently, and we will mostly work with what's already there. So the biggest challenge for architecture in the, in the future and not, so, not the future so far away, the, the future now, starting now, is really to understand how we can work with what's already there and, 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 but also not just change it to adapt it to new uh, energy standards and so on, but also to try to create these atmospheres. So mm -hmm. we will have to make very good spaces or out of most spaces which are already quite problematic. This is going to be the, the, big, the big challenge. <laughs> <laughs> and I was also thinking in connection to the habits, because in some way we will have to think about how we will design, respecting the habits of, of the culture. Um, but, but if we think that a lot of these habits have already been in some way, um, maybe corrupted is a, a hard term, but I think you understand what I mean by a lot of consumerism and so on. Uh, so how can we respectfully preserve uh, or, 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 or respect or understand that we have shaped a society with already this kind of habits of overconsumption, but try to reverse engineer the process by, by bringing up some healthier patterns, maybe more close to, to, to how we lived uh, in, in another time. So how, how do you think that this is going to work out? <laughs> I don't know. It's a very interesting question. It's it's really a very interesting question. I don't know. You know. I mean. I, I guess uh, when when you speak like that, I, the the one of the things that comes to my mind is uh, uh, some of the surrealist strategies that uh, that uh, slightly or sometimes more radically modify certain uh, existing conditions so that they express something that may be latent, but hidden, and that, uh, and that may, may in some way contribute to a, to a more wholesome way of life. Uh, 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 I, 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 I don't know, I, I would have to think more about it, but I think, I think you are right. I think it's, 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 a, it's a tricky problem, the question of, uh, of uh, I mean, what the future would be when it comes actually to the built environment with the, with the crisis uh, uh, of of the of the ecosystems, um, I don't know. It's uh, it's 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 quite tricky. I I, I just don't think that uh, that the problem is purely technical. You know, I I, I was reading. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, the, there is a uh, the the the, the uh, belief that uh, that somehow. Uh, uh, truly committing ourselves really politically uh, to to the question of uh, of uh, of the climate uh, crisis, uh, and this means money, of course, uh, could actually make a difference as opposed to our very kind of dark uh, doom scenarios. I don't know. I'm not an expert in this, but I I just uh, I just uh, believe that. Uh, that we cannot simply deal with the problem technically because we're still ultimately human beings, you know, and, and we've created this mess. But uh, but that that human condition that I was describing at the beginning, when you asked me what it means to be out of tune, I think I think it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, crucial regardless of the practical problems that we face. So it's not just about making buildings that. Uh, you know, like like uh, perfect zero emissions or whatever. You know, I don't even have the the vocabulary at the tip of my fingers. Um, but I think that uh, that the spiritual uh, dimension of architecture still needs to be acknowledged. Mm -hmm. And uh, so so it it it, it may be that uh, 
that in some intelligent way, some of these more playful uh, strategies uh, that uh, that we see, for example, in 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 that we it's already already present in the artistic avant-garde, <laughs> like in the early 20th century, might be a way to go because uh, because people because they were very serious these uh, surrealist guys, you know that it's not about changing the world completely. It's not about turning it upside down. It's about accepting what is there and then working with it in some clever way. So maybe irony, maybe, you know, I don't know. I, that's the way that I th think about these things, particularly when I have been faced with these issues with some uh, students of mine working with design problems. You know, this is, this is something that sometimes uh, crosses my mind and sometimes it's fruitful to think that way. Well, that, that makes me very hopeful, Alberto, because that's actually what I have been trying to do with my students. With to create, your own work? I know, exactly. exactly. To create this kind of, uh, I was reading recently about the theater of Brecht and how he used on purpose this concept of alienation and defamiliarization to make the viewer detached from something that seems familiar, but exactly. through this detachment, see the patterns, be able to observe the patterns and then make a decision what can be preserved and what can be transformed. And right. it, of course, it's not an easy process, uh, but I think it's absolutely necessary. So it's a kind of disturbance that we need. And the exercise we have this semester is exactly focused on movement patterns and on habits. So I am very, very curious how, how this wonderful group of students is going to deal with this task. And that's also what I tried to do a few weeks ago at the workshop at ETH Zurich that we did, we did this COVID gala, which was really very Dadaistic. Uh, and um, I hope soon that the documentation will come and then I might, I might share it. And, and in some other moment, we will talk about it. But it's absolutely uh, true that um, I think that, for example, the Situationists also in the 50s, they had this very specific program, political and artistic program of understanding the mechanisms of a system and using the mechanisms of a system to undermine it to, towards, a better, towards a better goal. So for example, taking, taking a random walk through the city instead of just following blindly what the city tells you to do, you to do. Yeah. for example. So this is also one of the exercises that I, I would like to give to my students. And I think that there is definitely a lot of potential here so that people can understand that, okay, the environment, the built environment somehow is bossy. <laughs> it tells you what to do, but you can reverse the process and you can actually uh, take agency. And I think that that will be also one way to, to start thinking about how we can change, change some things. Yes, um, I, 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 I think I, I agree with you completely. You know, I think that for this, uh, I always like uh, Gadamer's, I don't know if you read that with your students or if they read that in, in, of course they read German, so they could read it in the original. I have a, there's, it's a collection called The Relevance of the Beautiful, the relevance of the beautiful. I will add it to our biography. I, I think I would really, you know, if I read one, if I recommend one work of aesthetics, one to take to uh, to your island when you have to leave, I would recommend that one. Uh, it's fantastic. And one of the aspects, you know, he 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 really on unpacks why beauty matters matters precisely towards attunement, uh, because it's very hard to jump from the horrors of the apocalypse of the climate to, to, to artistic practices. And so it's, it's very important to have this uh, uh, understanding. It matters, like, and one, one of the aspects of this, of this condition of, of beauty that matters is its playfulness. It's how it connects to theater, how it connects to, and you know, he explains it beautifully well. It's a little book. It's, it's a collection of German essays that appear in different places with a bigger essay in the beginning. It's called The Relevance of the Beautiful in English. Fantastic, you know? And, and uh, I, that's what I would recommend for that. But I think that's, that's what I do with the students. It's, it's very complicated because people don't see very often how these this horrors of a technological world coming to pieces mm -hmm. connect to... to to these practices, but I think this is fundamental when we are talking about about health, you know, about feeling complete. Um, it's not about medicine, <laughs> or not yes. only about medicine. 
Uh, Alberto, and it's, it, it's also uh, because you mentioned the word horror, and I was talking to a friend uh, earlier today who is a psychologist, and I told him, you know, what disturbs me really when I am in my most neurotic moments is this horror of the everyday. And the horror of the everyday is like these uh, processes we know that are involved. We go to the supermarket and we get a, might get a piece of meat or something. And if we know the whole process, which is might be behind it and these whole structures. And recently I, I watched with my husband at home, a film called The Daily Bread which is on a movie. I don't know if anyone knows about it, uh, but it's, it's, it's a very recent film, but it's, it's, it's really interesting to watch, but it's not for everyone because it's very, it just films directly all the industrial processes that are involved in basically all the things that are structuring our existence. It's terrible, isn't it? And we just watch it and of course we can say okay there's a certain technological fascination of how this is possible but when we see the whole violence that is in there uh and and how we really have to to really retune and recalibrate our technology uh, to understand how we can better better adjust things because it and at the same time when i was watching it i had the question how did we even get here that we didn't know that, that things were being done in this way? That's right. That's right. Uh, That's but right. I, I don't want to be talking too much because I want to include our students and also Tatiana is here. I don't know, Tatiana, if you would like to make a comment now. Sure, please. Well, Maria, I would like to. I don't want to take too much time because I think this is this is an opportunity for your students. But I'll just say very briefly to start, and thank you, of course, to Alberto for the, the delightful conversation as always. But for me, really the core idea here is that the body is incomplete, right? The body is incomplete and perhaps it's one of the tasks of architecture to complete the body. And I think this is something that we really haven't explored enough, certainly not in design education of today, certainly not here in the United States. And, you know, I begin thinking of, of potential case studies like say Le Corbusier's, of course, La Tourette, but also Le Cabanon, uh, the, the tiny house that he created really with, with this same goal in, in that sense, the interior of Le Cabanon, so small around the body was meant to complete the body with the way that it functioned. And then I think about Louis Kahn's Salk Institute, which is just 10 minutes up the road here from, from my house in a very different way, right? In a very different way. How does that environment complete our understanding of ourself and the environment? And for me, it always does so in a very powerful way. So I think this is really what we need to investigate much more when we teach young architects. And I think of... Um, you know, the work of uh, say, say in music, yes? Who, who was the, the musician who allowed us to complete in the performance? Uh, John Cage? Of course, of yeah. course. So performances of John Cage come to mind and then the very wonderful readings of say the Russian Mikhail Bakhtin. Mikhail Bakhtin who explored the relationship between the author and the reader and the, you know, really the new role of the reader in completing our spaces and in creating that, turning that, that score, which is really quite meaning, you know, meaningless without the, the performance. But I'd, I'd love to hear from the students and how they engage with this, these ideas. Yes, we, we had a few questions already before after we watched the lecture and we also have Fiorella here who, who joined us also if you would like to make a question you're also very welcome. I think. Hi, uh, ah, yeah. Okay, hi I'm from Latin America and I have this problem uh, how to explain the importance of the embodied architecture when we have a lot of uh, important uh, urban problems like, uh, I don't, I, sorry, um, it's like 
We have a, a lot of human problems to the ab ability of the, uh, the, per the persons around the city. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if we could understand your question. Um, uh, sorry, how can I explain the, impor the importance of the experience of the architecture when we have a lot of pro uh, urban problems like uh, seem, seems like more important than the experience of the architecture. I, I don't know. It's, more clear. Uh, yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. Let, let me let me get a stab at that. I think it's not only urban. I mean, in the if you if you're gonna go at that scale, is really what we were saying. What I was trying to say before is that the world seems to be in crisis, like everywhere, right? Yeah, like you know, the 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 forests are disappearing, the oceans are terribly polluted. We have huge problems. Of course, we have huge problems, and uh, but but that doesn't mean that we are less of spiritual beings. And what I'm saying here is basically that architecture's concern, like the central concern, has to do with this condition of hum of humans that are basically open to death. We are incomplete. We are out of tune. So. We can, if you, I mean, if it's your vocation to go and demonstrate against climate change, I'm not going to stop you. If, it, if you want to go and work, you know, at the level of city government, I think you could do a good job as well. But, but we're speaking here about architecture, and it's a problem, I agree, because sometimes architecture is understood as something kind of elitist that really has to do with rich people, you know, and that is actually of course, very badly represented by all these star architects that appear as geniuses and all they do is funny forms that, that, that basically have consumer value. And I agree that's horrible, but that doesn't that not take away the fact that the place where you live is not really the space, it's not really the computer screen where you are looking at me. It's really something that matters to you as an embodied being. You know, and that's the responsibility of the architect. You know, it can, it can actually be terrible for your consciousness if these places are not eloquent, if, this, if these places don't connect to you in an emotional level. You know, you can feel really dejected, more dejected than what you might feel by thinking about the environment falling apart. So it's different scales. And we have a problem because we misunderstand what architects do. Architects themselves misrepresent what the profession is. So it's very complicated. And I really sympathize with your question. But this does not take anything away from what we are saying. You know, even if we save the world from destroying, well, actually, the world will be fine. We would die. The whole human race will die. The world eventually would heal itself, actually. Right, so it's more about us ultimately. You know, it's we talk about saving the planet, right? saving ourselves. Right, it's let's let's be honest. Uh, so the, saving ourselves is not enough. We have we have to deal with this condition, which is what the architecture has always been dealing with. It has to do with the with with the the spiritual human condition. You see, so that's all I'm talking about. And it's like I said, it's a problem because architects themselves don't often understand this. They think of their work as some kind of either formal nonsense or optimization, right? And neither of the two is architecture. So, um, so I, I really understand deep down. I know that because I feel it myself. I know what you're talking about. I hope I got you right, if that's what you mean. Yeah, but thank you. Thanks, Fiorella, for bringing up your question. Uh, now, here from our seminar, uh, Rafael had made a comment before, and I would like to bring bring his comment when when we talked after after we watched the lecture together. We talked in class, and Rafael was mentioning this idea. We made it in connection with efficiency, 
and optimization, maybe now you would like to bring some something up again in connection to our conversation. Yeah, I think that's uh, kind of the same idea that uh, Fiorella uh, just uh, mentioned. I think nowadays um, architecture is more about uh, you know the optimization, the systemization, all that technology behind it, and I think really the problem there is that not humans anymore make the kind of the architecture. It's more kind of the technology defines architecture, and it's not like it was the human made. You know, like through your lecture, I kind of witnessed that uh, architecture is the three dimensional, you know, expansion of our or like of an architecture's brain. I, I think. I, uh, I realized that, and I think um, what we nowadays do is it's too optimized, and still there are people behind the computers, uh, but um, we just you know put pieces and put them there, and it's not our own you know moving and our own design process anymore. I think, and uh, so I just realized that through that lecture and uh, it, it kind of uh, made me made me thinking and it's really interesting um, I don't know how we can change it as uh, as young architects uh, as young uh, designers because you know we are uh, we are depending on these new technologies and uh, we have to use them or we should use them and um, I think there has to be a way between optimization and uh, as you said, that architecture that is for rich people. And so I think really we need that irritation, you know, something that irritates us. It's not just the linear, I don't know. So that was my uh, thoughts on that. And no, it's well said, Raphael. I don't know what to add to that, but. Uh, yeah, it wasn't a question. I'm so, I'm sorry. I just uh, realized that, uh, and it, uh, but through your lecture, and uh, it's really interesting. You know, I'm at the end of my uh, my interior architecture studies now. I'm I did my masters, and uh, actually that's my last course. And now I realized, uh, you know, these uh, things that, uh, you know, it's kind of a extension of uh, uh, like a three dimensional extension of our brains and our of our consciousness yeah. and that's I, I think that's really interesting that got me really hooked yeah I, I find it helpful to to know to know the history that to know that this is not really that recent that actually we ourselves as architects put ourselves in this predicament in many ways uh, precisely because we had to like from the 19th century onwards uh, architects needed to survive in this technological world, so they became, they started to play this, this game that we're still playing, you know. This really has a, a beginning, it, it can be dated to the, around 1810 in, in Paris with the, with the, the work of Durand that then becomes really very, he was a very important teacher and he, he got, like, the books were very, very, very popular and this way of thinking of the architect as someone that basically is responsible basically to, to build shelters uh, and for nothing else than pure pleasure. That's the way that it's, it's really the problem. It's about pleasure rather than meaning, you know? Previously architects were concerned, however complicated the problem is, is to give meaning to human experience. Uh, uh, it's not just about making things pleasurable. This is 19th century and onwards. So, so it's interesting to know that it's only 200 years and it's, we've created a very problematic world out of that belief. Uh, and uh, anyhow, it's, uh, so we, we actually are, you know, we are in a discipline that has this kind of long history where if you look carefully, there has been this understanding of what it's at stake, which is meaning, but then it, then it gives that up. The discipline gives it up to become you know, a, a kind of service discipline. It grows out of engineering in the Ecole Polytechnique de Paris. 
you know? And then eventually the guys take their marbles and go to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and ally themselves with the painters, but they don't have too much in common with the painters either. You know, this idea that architecture is like one of the fine arts, this is also very new. It's, a, you know, it's an 18th century, 19th century thing. It's not that. It's, it's more interesting and more complicated, uh, but the problem is that you're right, you know? We, we are expected to operate in certain, in, in certain patterns. Uh, however, if you have the patience to look at history, you realize that there is this kind of deep condition, this tradition that is there for anyone that wants to take it seriously. <laughs> it's not easy to operate in the contemporary world in those terms, but you know, it's neither an art in the sense of painting. It is not engineering either. It's something of its own that is closer to a social discipline. You know, and, and it's, it's interesting. This debate happened in education, in architecture in the early 19th century, and then it disappeared. You know, and now, for example, you in Germany, it's about engineering. I know, you know, I've been in many places. It's really conceptualized mm -hmm. within engineering. It's very pathetic and mm -hmm. makes very many problems. But, uh, but that's the reality of the discipline. It has this, I'm not making up the history of the discipline, it's there. You just have to check it out. Yeah. Um, I, I think we as uh, young architects might have the chance to change it a little bit because, you know, the, the, the tendency is that you only, um, you know, you have all your rules, you know, actually you can build architecture only with rules, you know, you, you have uh, how much area you need in an office, how high it should be, how how warm, how, how much windows, you know, you, you can just build it by dad or you say maybe I just rethink it and I um, yeah my, maybe do it a little bit different or I put some irritation in, into that I, I don't know but yeah it's uh, I think it's very really <laughs> important. interesting way to call it irritation yes <laughs> this, this is a very German it's a very German uh, thing to say this uh, yes, irritation. Yes, yes. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, but I don't know why it just feels like uh, it it, uh, it fit, fits, you know, like uh, how atmosphere is built. I, you, you don't know, but something is different than the normal because if it's all same, it doesn't have that much atmosphere. And if it, something is off for, you know, in nature, nothing is always the same so uh, there is yeah. always a little irritation or something so uh, i don't know if right, you know feels... i, I I'll, I'll go back to gadamer this this one of the uh, arguments that he makes is that a good work of art is always both new and familiar and that's the that's the challenge you know so that what is new yes sometimes it's kind of irritating mm -hmm. but but it's not only it can on, it cannot only be a, like a hitting on your head you know you have to recognize something as familiar as well mm -hmm. for it to make sense. Yeah, that's, that, that's that condition, Gadamer, he's a very fantastic German philosopher, really one of the best. You should take a look. Yes, and, and uh, all, all avant-garde that, that, that is really avant-garde tends to be rejected from the beginning because it makes people very uncomfortable or it's, it's not really, uh, or it doesn't sell well because people maybe don't like don't like to, to uh, acknowledge what they see there. So these are all interesting, interesting components. I also had to think about um, another thread from the lecture that you had this slide where you had uh, Boulet versus Durand. So really this conflict, this tension that we still feel between the poetic imagination and the pragmatic vision. And this is still something that is also still very, very present and it, it connects a lot to a lot of the topics we have been discussing. Uh, Maria, uh, I have a question for Alberto about design education, because clearly a lot of the changes that we're discussing here, you know, that are crucial, and we must rethink the role of the architect in society. And I think that begins in the way that we educate young architects. Clearly the educational system, especially the studio, format here in the United States in schools is, is broken. 
Uh, many have spoken about this. And I wonder, you know, what are some practical steps that we can begin to take now to begin to reform, to recast design education in order to address some of these important issues? Oh, this is a huge conversation, Tatiana. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's begin maybe with, with, you know, with the studio model and, and let's begin with the idea of the, the role of the architect. And clearly we have architects teaching here who themselves were taught 20, 30, 40 years ago in the old model and education is, is stagnating. No, I mean, there, there seems to be no way out. Yeah, well, you know, I, I, I tried my... I had a model at some point for three years, I was director of a school. The, 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 it made a difference. I, I made it, I'm very happy because the most recent director now has me on their website as, as a kind of, as history. Like mm -hmm. when, this, when the school changed, <laughs> it's nice. I'm still not dead and- Well, uh, sh share <laughs> some strategies with us though. Yes. yes, but it's complicated because it really has to do with contextual conditions, right? What you find, and what you can change. Um, and you know, in that case, I have some, I can tell you over a glass of wine, all the things that I did there. What did I do with the people that didn't want to help me, for example, you know? <laughs> how, how did I deal with this faculty? They were all older than me and I, I had to do something about it. And what I changed was first year and fifth year. Basically I made fifth year into real research with mm -hmm. a humanistic uh, component, a whole year thesis where they, people wrote a paper very much like in a European context, but it was very uncommon in, in North America. Uh, in North America, it's the opposite. Like now people don't do thesis, they just do a project. Or if they call it thesis, they don't know what it means. Uh, so I changed that and I changed first year. Uh, and I left the older colleagues of mine to teach in between. And then in fourth year, I had a, a very serious program abroad, you know, where students really traveled. Uh, studied, uh, did work out, outside of the school. Um, so those are a few things, but you know, yes, we could, this is a huge discussion. And I think it really has to do with, with giving proper place to history. And it means teaching history properly. And that's another huge conversation because people often think history is useless because we have so many problems today. It's the same, the same question that Fiorella was asking. Why would I worry about what happened in Rome or in Greece? What am I going to learn from that? Uh, and so if you don't know how to, if you don't frame that properly, you cannot teach it. And that's something that is a huge conversation in its own right. I think we need to teach history well, rather than- Absolutely. At all years, right? Every single year. Well, we have and, to- And I believe research as well. And, you know, let me just say, I don't think research needs to be uh, relegated or you know isolated just in the last year. I believe we have to introduce research methods right nice. in the first year. In the first year, focusing on the human sciences, and we all know when we look at neuro these neuroscience for architecture programs, some of these experiments that have been tried, we know this is not the answer. We're not going to turn architects into neuroscientists. There's no need for this, but we do need to introduce research in a very oh, yes. serious yes. way in every yes. year of architecture and especially in the design studio. Yes. Now, right? in, in, my, in, in, my, in my mind, research, you know, has to be, you would call it, yeah, research methodologies. I would actually introduce them to the concept of hermeneutics from the beginning, because that's the, what I find really invaluable as research in the humanities, but that's polemical. You know, because you might think that no, they have to deal, they have to uh, have a, a, a quantitative research in some way. You know, so, I mean, it's very complicated. I don't think we can solve that in this conversation. But, but if you are asking me, I, the, the way that I, because the history of architecture is not the history of buildings. It's, it really has to do with the history of culture. And it's a question of interpretation. You know, what I do in my books, for example, is take something which is in a book or which exists as a ruin and I interpreted to understand how, for instance, arguing that Vitruvius was interested in, 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 in health and well-being is something that comes from a hermeneutic operation. You have to make the work speak in relation to the problems that affect us today. So that's, it's, it's, this is really what for me would be good, the, 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 the right way to teach history. It's not just about documenting buildings or knowing a lot about 
uh, Indian buildings and Chinese buildings because we now cannot be Eurocentric, you know, which is what is becoming now fashionable. So now, now, now students are learning about Chinese buildings. It's fine, you know, I have nothing against that, but I think the, that's not proper history either. Um, it's very tricky, that, 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 Tatiana. I was actually uh, invited once to China. They were honoring the, the professors, very nice people, beautiful people that used to teach the history of Western architecture and were actually punished during the Cultural Revolution because they were teaching the history of Western buildings, really. And you know, I, it's very interesting because I had long conversations about what it meant to teach history there in that context. It became very clear that, well, they were trying their best, but, but you know, was it really meaningless to a Chinese student to, to know the history of European buildings? I'm not sure. You know what I mean? It's really complicated what it means to teach history properly because you really have to start with questions that matter. Uh, so it involves it's a kind of philosophical position as well. Yes, yes. But I, I just wanted to say that I think that that can begin right in the first year. It's not that we wait for students to, you know, no, become can, in, more mature can, and sophisticated somehow in the thesis year. But we need to create that foundation, right? Yeah, we also we are also impatient. This is a problem, you know. The architect, the architect's education was. At least we had five years to take it easy. Now it's such a pain with all these programs, uh, graduate programs, uh, where you the uh, students get crammed all this technical stuff that they need to go and service the offices of the people that are practicing. Basically, it's what it is. You know, they don't learn to be uh, rounded individuals. It's that's the that's that for me would be the first order of business. Is we are teaching rounded individuals in universities, otherwise it's not worth it. You can go apprentice in practice to be part of a, of a mechanism. Absolutely, you know? well, that, that is, I think, the way to begin to recast the education of an architect. And of course, Yohani Palazma and I have had so many discussions about this, the, yeah. the need for introduction of really humanism, right? right. And, and the humanities, right. again, right from the first year, in the education of an architect. So, you know, I'm sorry that I have this strong focus right now, but this is, this is my approach to affecting change, the kind of change that we were discussing at the start of this conversation. It's through the redesign of, of the curriculum, yes? Oh yeah, I understand. Yeah, Tatiana, but this, this was great because uh, if, we, if we understand that we have all these problems with the profession, and if we really want to change it, we have to start it with the education. It has to be really from, from, from the root. Uh, and I also find it interesting, uh, very interesting, Alberto, that you and Tatiana, that you mentioned this with the, with the topic of humanism and how this should really be the focus of, of uh, design uh, education. And uh, I remember my, my first office experience after, after I finished my architectural diploma, which was an absolute disaster for a lot of reasons, which I will not start enumerating now. But in one of the very strong conflicts I had with, with the person I was uh, working for or learning from at, at the time was, uh, he presented me this argument that it was very difficult to have me there because I was this little piece that didn't that didn't fit perfectly with any parts of the machinery he was building there. And at the time I really took it as a compliment because I, I, I had already had it with with all the system that he was <laughs> that he was building there. And that's exactly when I decided that I was going to study more and do something else because that that could not be my life. It wouldn't work well for any part involved. Mm -hmm. And I and I still think it was a good decision. And I think it's very important for our students that they that they can also understand that they don't have to accept being just some part which is punched, punched into being a part of a mechanism. That there, there's more to the profession and there's more to life than, than just settling for that. Yeah. Milton, I think you want to bring something up. A couple of things. One of them is I agree with education being a driver, but it's only half the driver. The other has to do with whether the public believes that a humane architecture is valuable. And I think that that is, there has to be an appetite so that the offices will see that they have to feed something that's valuable. And I agree also that, that a humanistic 
education is the foundation for doing anything right in society, whether you're a lawyer or an architect um, or, or a physician or any non-professional, anything to be able to understand is important. I think this goes back to the, to the uh, blank slate and the arrogance of thinking that what we think is what matters as opposed to the research side or the social side, which is to go bottom up, but really to do it with um, a philosophical platform that is solid with science being able to feed into that and be and to absorb it. Um, I think that's a, uh, a critical part of the puzzle. I see in education actually something that goes back to what Raphael was talking about a little bit about, I think Raphael, you were talking in the sense about reductionism that all we get to deal with is dimension or zoning or building codes and things like that. We treat pre-design the same way in a reductionist manner that it's only about how many square feet for this and that, but real pre-design is the philosophy that should go and the attitude and the tone and the affect that a building should have before we start drawing lines with our preconceptions and our sense of a time of rasa. It needs to be bottom up. So part of the educational reform that I push is that pre-design is a kind of research and it should precede any design and it becomes a rich and robust part of what, what we do. Um, that's in response to what we've just been talking about. But I also wanna go back to something that Alberto was talking about earlier with music and Palladio because perfection in music at one time was that it had to be mathematically perfect, that the scale had to be divided, 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 and divided, but it didn't sound right. So now that, so in Bach's time, tempering mm -hmm. became a solution to it because that way these intervals actually fit the way our brains took those sounds in. So fifths weren't, or fourths weren't quite right. So tempering, the well-tempered clavier was taking the perfection, so-called, out of the musical scale and instead creating something that feels warm, feels like we're at home in those musical intervals. Yeah, you're right, Milton. That's exactly what it is, yes. And there's, of course, the whole concept of optical correction, which, uh, which comes from Vitruvius, that really is connected to that, you know, that you, you, you have this ideal concept of proportionality that really comes from there, from Plato and, and the Greeks and then through Vitruvius, but that you always have to adjust according to the situation. Right, you you if, it, if something is very high up, you don't you don't really proportion it uh, mathematically. You adjust it so that it looks as perfect as possible to experience. It's a completely anti-perspectival understanding of design. It's anything but a picture. What rules is the experience, and I like that. And this is actually becomes was actually uh, accepted uh, without questioning until the late seventeenth century. You know that you needed this kind of tempering, as you say, in architecture. It's only after Perrault and then, the, and then, of course, in the 19th century, that uh, that this idea of optical correction becomes a, is accused of being a, a misunderstanding. You know, it's uh, like Perrault says: it's because the people didn't, it's because the craftsmen were very bad. The craftsmen didn't know what they were doing. The architects would have wanted perfection, but the craftsmen were stupid. This, it turns the thing completely upside down. If you, wonder, if you look at it historically, it's very clear, you know? Whereas in fact, it was always about tempering. And you know, for the curriculum, uh, Tatiana, I, 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 I appreciate these uh, discussions about, about ideal possibilities, but I think in the end, one would really have to say, where are we starting with? Where are we operating? What are we talking about? Are we changing the school in San Diego? Or are, we, are you appointed? You really need to understand this also politically. <laughs> <laughs> to be able to even consider what is possible, right? So I'm I'm not very patient with this because with these conversations of an ideal curriculum, because I guess I did it once and I know how difficult it is. You really have to deal with the reality of what of of the context. If you tell me, okay, now let's let's all get together, Tatiana, Alberto, Milton, and of course Maria, we make a new school, or we we are landed in some kind of institution. Let's think strategically, what are we going to change? Then it starts to matter because we have to deal with something from the bottom up. But Alberto, that's exactly what I'm speaking about. I, I never mentioned the idea of an ideal curriculum. That, oh, that I is, know, I know, I know. That, you is, know, I that know. is not my approach. But, you know, I wonder, listening to all of this from you and Milton also, isn't one of the key concepts to begin to teach, to introduce to new students is that 
the, the built space actually must be incomplete. No, that's how we start to turn it around on its head is that it must be unfinished because there's an empathetic relationship we need to engage with in a dialogue, in a dialogue with the people who will use the, those spaces. And before we can do that, we must understand those people, no? That's where, that's where humanism and the idea of research needs to come in. So I feel like until we get that idea across to our educators and the stagnating environment, you know, in many design schools and to our future students, it's that concept that it must be incomplete and unfinished and that it can only be finished through human occupation yeah. and movement and experience. Now, isn't that a key idea? Yes, yes, of course. It's a, it's really a hermeneutic model. Is that the whole operation uh, emerges out of a dialogue, right? It's really a conversation. That's right. That's right. Well, and here again we go back to Bartin. Now, Alberto, have you? I'm sure you've read Michael Bartin thoroughly. Yeah, a lot, but I've read some of it. Yeah. Yeah, I think I always go back to him because this is where the importance of dialogue comes in. No, the the narr the creation of the narrative and dialogue and the reader. The reader really taking over, taking over the work and completing it. Mm -hmm. um, and that, that has not even entered design education yet. No, so we're not going to create an ideal model, but we will think of it in terms of context. And I think it's absolutely urgent. You know? it's, it's critical. Maybe, maybe it's a bouillon base and maybe we're, con maybe we're contributing flavors and seeing, <laughs> seeing who wants to taste. Um, the other, the other concept I think really, uh, for me, uh, I associate with what we've been talking about is Enfulu. And what is the empathic connection between the built environment and the people who, who it's for? And is there a resonance? Is there a dialogue? Is there a connection? Is there a change over time that's encouraged as opposed to discouraged? You know, I think that sense of the, whether it's the artist or the musician or the architect, um, there is, has to be this sense of, reaching out and letting something reach back. Yeah, I, I agree with this, Milton, but in here I would also add that maybe for this process and maybe in connection to, to what Tatiana was also saying about the, about the stagnation, because this is also something, it was this feeling of stagnation and also the feeling that I couldn't fit in with this, <laughs> not in the studies and not in the in the uh, work context that that motivated me to to try to f figure out my way and try to do something different. And I, I think I still try to do it with these conversations and hopefully the seminars and the, the YouTube channel that, that they can trigger more of these of these processes, because I think it's really important also to to change the perspectives and to change the way that we are that we are thinking about design and and also to create these these irritations that that kind of break the passivity and 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 make us more alert of, of some of these patterns that we have accepted oh this is how we teach architecture this is how we design this this is how things are and really to step back uh, step back and creating creating something new and, and really revising everything that we have been doing uh, now I I, re I have to be a bit sensitive with my students because we started at four so we have already been here for some time so I will just ask if there's one more question I, I will give it to them You're all okay. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Maria. Okay. I'm also going to go for lunch because my sugar level is low. So. Oh, Alberto. <laughs> I also I, I mentioned the students first, but of course I should have mentioned. And, and, and you, you must go for dinner, I guess. So. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Alberto, for for sharing your time, and thank you also to Tatiana and to Milton, and of course to to the students. You, Tatiana and Milton. Take care of yourselves. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye, Alberto. Thank you. Thank you.